Hi, Robert. Hi, everybody. Hope you're having a good show there in Las Vegas. Uh, Got to say, Vegas was always kind of one of the major milestones, as you may know, CES shows and whatnot. Uh, and I understand this. you're doing the TED this year, the Plus 4 C116, C16, C2-32, C364. I miss one? 264. Said 116, right? Um, and, and you know how I feel about that. If you've seen some of the other videos, uh, I, I kind of liked the series. But without uh, Mr. Jack Tramiel there, uh, you know, once he left, the series kind of sat out on the front doorstep like a crying baby in a basket and nobody knew what to do with it. So they thought they turned it into something that looked like a C64, and that's how the C16 was made. Now you know the whole story. So other than that, I got a different computer to show you, and uh, it's the LCD computer. And the story of the LCD was um, when we were done with the plus four stuff, we started the LCD. And basically what happens is the, the project team's disbanded. You, you go off and do little things. There's maintenance, you know, things you do. You clean up some schematics or fix a design for production or something. And then you start to, uh, it's, it's kind of like a stellar nursery. You kind of start to, you know, coalesce into projects. And, and as management goes, Oh, look at that. I can get a bonus if uh, we do that. And he takes it, shows his boss, and his boss goes, Well, I could get a really big bonus if we do, and so on and so on. And so once you get to certain milestones, you add people to your team. You get to have double the number of pencils. All kinds of things happen as you, as you kind of grow into that. So I was originally working on the LCD machine. Um, you know, this one came from the top uh, also, obviously, because, uh, you know, we owned a, an LCD glass company, so somebody was thinking ahead. The glass company was uh, Eagle Pitcher, and uh, uh, we were the only people in America that had, or we, yeah, we were the only glass manufacturer in America. Er everything else came from overseas, and I'll tell you back then, the, the glass itself, uh, you know, the LCD panel part was, I believe it was pretty much one manufacturer back then. So, but we had a jump, typical Commodore jump, jump you know. Uh, other people are, you know, using 6845 Motorola graphics display processors. We're making Vic chips. We're making SID chips, you know. So we're making LCD uh, uh, LCD panels ourselves, and we were going to make the... We actually did the controller as a gate array, and I don't know why, because I was off by then. But we'll talk about that for a second here. So I was on the LCD computer, and we were looking for people to join us. Particularly, we had... Uh, known we wanted a modem built in. There was a silent 700 sat off in the office every day. It turns out we were being charged like 2000 a month for that thing. And it uh, turns out it goes all the way back to the days of Chuck Peddle. We've been getting charged for that. It never showed up because, it, you know, it wasn't capital equipment investment. It was just an expense. So they didn't. Here, here's a silent 700. It paid for itself like 28 billion times. So, um, but we wanted a modem in there. And we hired Jack Porter, who came out of AT&T in... Indianapolis, and I'm from Indiana, and he didn't have an Indiana, see I can't even say Indiana, Indiana accent, um, which, so I don't know how he pulled, pulled that off, but, um, and, and we all, so Jeff really knew modems, he also knew the FCC requirements, whether it's FCC Part 68, so Part J, or whatever it is, I've forgotten, but it's for telephone equipment to touch the uh, telephone lines. So real quick, it became obvious that, um, we brought, both weren't needed on the same project. I mean, Jeff was a rock star, and, and in Commodore, you, when you get something like that, you, you turn them loose as fast as you can. They t return me loose on something else is what happened. And uh, that's when Freddie Bowen and me hooked up for the uh, C-128 or whatever it's called at the time. We renamed it C-128 when uh, we decided to do the 64 thing. Um, so at that point, I, took, I had done the initial design of the LCD and including the MMU, and this is where I put a lot of my time in was the MMU because uh, I wanted to speed some things up where the editor in the LCD, I wanted it to not be a piece of memory and you move what you're editing to it and then move it back because at one megahertz you could see it go, you know, it was kind of slow. Uh, so what I wanted was the, um, the editor to just be a pointer into memory. And so you see it as it sits in memory. And uh, so that was the goal. And it wasn't until after the, everything's done, we're past CES, and I said something about that, and they said, no, we didn't do it. And I said, what? That, that's kind of, why didn't you do it? And he said, well, they wanted the, the, the 25th line, we called it, the function key line, and, and, and it's, it's how we do today. We still number the function keys by putting tech drive. 
and and so that would have that wouldn't have been able to be put in memory. Well, I'm like, well, you you, you grab the chip designer, you shake him real hard, and you say, I want I'm going to give you a, another register that points to another place in memory, and you go fetch the 25th line separately. They didn't do that, and the chip designer did what he wanted to do, and uh, at the end, the programmers paid the price of having to shuffle the memory there, and the user would have paid the price of having a little more delay than they would have. So that's that's kind of the story behind it. So I took the MMU with me on, onto the 128, and that's where all the banking and stuff comes from. So if we take a look here, all right. So here's the LCD computer. Now this plastic is not ABS. This is a real hard plastic and this is from what we call a soft tool. So this this case is probably a fifteen or twenty thousand dollar case. Um, it's got very cheap scotch tape that's thirty five years old holding it together and this is how we powered it up. My unit's from the lab and I am missing the battery drawer door. The keyboard, the keypad is really nice. This keypad is really nice. It's made by Mitsumi, and what it is, this is not very tall. It's beveled really hard, and it gives the illusion that they're taller than they are, but this is a short throw key, and it's got a real nice key click to it. So th this was a first in my book um, of things to come, real positive key key click, um, where, where in the Commodore 64, you remember those big uh, black towerish tall keypad keys these are real nice and flat and and you can see we've got graphic symbols written on top of them and stuff well, let's go All right so and the power switch is here on the sign on the right we have a barcode plug line and phone 6 volt DC acoustic coupler connector, modem and printer, and you see there's DTE, DCE, D, uh, uh, jumper settings here. So remember that whole DCE, DTR thing? Well, we had it so you could change it. RS-232 port, Centronics port, serial port, reset button, hey, everybody likes a reset button, expansion port, this is a master reset actually. Here's another reset. I assume it deals more with the expansion connector and a contrast control. So a lot of controls specific to the LCD that we hadn't seen at Commodore before. So also the size was, was nice and, and for back then. Oh yes, and here is here's our cursor keys as, as actual little arrow shaped keys. I wish I could remember where that came from because I, I just know there's a story behind it. I just can't remember the story. This was this is a memory board, and if you can see it, it's back in the days when we put uh, we still had solder underneath the solder mask, so everything's wrinkled. But this is just big old bulky static RAMs and EEPROMs, a bunch of EEPROM sockets here, and then. This socket was meant to be accessible through the top drawer, and it's got special socket that you can put uh, ROMs in there easier. It's a side wiper socket. So here's our motherboard. By the way, I have three pages of the schematic, and I don't have the fourth page. And I've even asked Jeff Porter if he's got one. I don't know if he's had time to look for it, but um, so I don't have the full picture of what's here. Uh, we do have some old Panasonic NICAD batteries, kind of a first for Commodore. Here's um, the, the circuitry for the telephone. So you'll see your standard uh, uh, caps, uh, suppression cap and the, uh, and the, uh, and the um, coupling transformer. Uh, little DIN connectors. Here's a, oh, the, so the DTE, DC thing were switches. This is a, um, this is the voltage DC to DC converter and we didn't uh, really come across these b back then very much so this is how uh, Jeff got all his various uh, voltages. Alright, moving on, we've standard uh, 
uh, ferrite beads, a, a real tight grid on the on the ground plane. Uh, that's a kind of different style. I uh, I'd be interested to see how that does in, in, as far as having a, a low inductance, given that it's as much error as as not. But that's that's very interesting looking. I kind of like that. Uh, so if I just go around pointing at parts here real quick, um, here I've got the the gate array uh, for the LCD. It says R0 in it. I'm sure it's hand bonded because the lid's half glu uh, hand glued on. It looks like a 6510 processor, 6522 uh, IO uh, um, IO piece. And I'm looking to see if these things these things aren't even CMOS. This one's CMOS. I don't think that one is. So, um, DC to DC converter, we've even got a fuse, our DTE, DCE switches that I was showing you earlier, our phone area, NICAD batteries, some lots of analog. This thing actually had a switch on and off its, its battery power. I think that's a 6510 there, uh, but you know what? I'm not going to swear anything here because I didn't realize there was two hand bonded chips um, but they are definitely hand bonded this one is a this is 5707 and this is a 5706 if I had a guess I'd, I'd say they're probably both gate arrays metal metal mass gate arrays uh, from uh, not Kyocera I'll think of it later not Hitachi got an EEPROM uh, 6522 there's your 6551 UART NICAD battery, your modem stuff, this is your DC, DC converter, kind of an early one um, compared to what they make now. And just, you know, the regular kind of glue, some analog, I'm sure there's a reset circuit in here. They had a control turning power on and off, so it could do something similar to sleeping. And uh, that's about it. So now this I had to, when I opened it, the bottom was full of rust. And I had to uh, attack it chemically to clean it up, and it is cleaned up. And oh, actually, uh, yellow wires from me working. So you can. So the inside of the case, there's there's the rust stains, and this is I was able to get the board this clean, and you see a fair number of jumpers. Again, um, this is a, a a lab one. This would have been used by Ian or Jeff to get it working. The piezoelectric disc that normally is soldered in here is put away just because it was hanging loose. I didn't like that. And uh, that's what an LCD machine looks like on the inside. All right, so I understand we'd like to plug it in um, and maybe see it operate. It'll be the first time in, uh, what, 35 years? So I'm going to get the power here applied. They put the jumpers on. And then here we go, three two, one.